Welcome aboard. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, celebrating our 23rd year of service to the amateur radio community all around the world. We are North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1195 of This Week in Amateur Radio. The FCC says that all amateur operation in the 3.45 to 3.5 gigahertz band segment must cease by April 14, 2022. Aries volunteers activate as wind-driven year-end wildfires destroys over a thousand homes in Colorado. We will have the details. A new section manager is appointed in northern New York. We will introduce you. Two radio amateurs are appointed to the FCC's Technological Advisory Council. An extended team from the ARRL will support February's ARRL National Convention at the upcoming Orlando Hamcation in Florida. We will have team coverage. Are you looking for a job? The FCC is seeking an attorney advisor for its mobility division. Germany's Amateur Radio Society, the DARC, was hit by a cyber attack this week. We will have the details. The eruption of the underwater volcano has disrupted just about all communications on Tongo. We will take a look. And scientists have built the world's smallest antenna using DNA. We will tell you all about it in this week's report. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all of those amateur satellites in orbit. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, will explain the alphabet soup behind the current high-definition television receivers. Australia's own Arnold Benshop, VK6FLAB, explains that he was considering building a parrot repeater, except he has a different idea from what you are thinking. Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOY, returns with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives. This week, Bill takes us back to the World Radio Telecommunications Conference of 1938. How did amateur radio come out of the conference? Our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, explains the protocols of working and tower climbing with others. All of this and a lot more is straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our Below Zero headquarters here in frigid Albany, New York, and sitting in for Don Hewlett, K2ATJ, who is away on assignment, I'm George, W2XBS. And reporting from the newsroom in Half Moon, New York, I'm Terry Saunders, N1KIN. And reporting from our news bureau in Cortlandville, New York this week, where it's a little chilly, you know, maybe a windbreaker kind of day, or maybe even downright frigid. I'm Chris Perrine, KB2FAF. And from Studio One of our Central Florida News Bureau, where the chilly weather is back upon us again, I'm Fred, November Fox, 2 Fox. And reporting from what feels like the North Pole, but is really just our news bureau in Troy, New York. I'm Eric, KD2, RJX. And reporting from our news bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where we'd like to see the freezer door get closed, I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. And now with this week's lead story, here is Terry Saunders, N1KIN. Leading off our news this week, the Federal Communications Commission has established April 14th, 2022 as the date by which amateur radio transmissions must stop in the upper 3.45 to 3.5 gigahertz segment of the amateur secondary 9 centimeter band. Secondary operations are permitted to continue indefinitely in the remainder of the band, 3.3 to 3.45 gigahertz, pending future FCC proceedings. On January 14th, the Commission released DA-22-39, which announces the results of Auction 110 for the 3.45 to 3.55 GHz band. Release of this notice triggered FCC rules adopted last year requiring that amateur radio operations between 3.45 GHz and 3.5 GHz cease within 90 days of the public notice. 
In October 2021, AWRL President Rick Roderick, K5UR, urged Congress to direct the FCC to preserve amateur radio's secondary use of the 3 gigahertz band in a written statement responding to H.R. 5378, the Spectrum Innovation Act of 2021, before the U.S. House Commerce, Communications, and Technology Subcommittee. A chronology of actions responding to amateur access on the 3.5 gigahertz band can be found on the AWRL website. Nine Boulder County, Colorado Amateur Radio Emergency Services volunteers turned out on December 30th, 2021, as the devastating Marshall Fire roared through Superior and portions of Louisville, Colorado. With more details on Amateur Radio's response to the emergency call, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, reporting from Ellsworth, Maine. Intense winds whipped a grass fire south of Boulder near Marshall into a massive firestorm that became too large and fierce for firefighters to battle. The only battle was evacuation, said amateur TV enthusiast Jim Andrews, KH6HTV of Boulder. Andrews said the only thing limiting the fire spread was the fact that the winds diminished by that evening, but by then hundreds of homes had burned. Andrews House among them, thousands had to evacuate. Boulder County Aries Board of Directors Chairman and Region 1 District 3 Emergency Coordinator Alan Bishop, K0ARK, said that a request from the Boulder County Office of Emergency Management to activate the Emergency Operations Center initiated the Aries activation. Aries volunteers supported communication at evacuation sites and established emergency communication as commercial power failures and preventive shutdowns by utilities caused a loss of commercial communication. Cell phones and landlines eventually failed to fill the gap. Boulder County Amateur Radio Emergency Services activated the Mountain Emergency Radio Network. Andrew said residents had no official warning of the coming firestorm. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. To facilitate a restoration of these emergency services, B-CARES activated the Mountain Emergency Radio Network, Bishop said. Established in 2010, MERN consists of repeaters installed at fire stations in Gold Hill and Ellens Park, at community centers in Nederland and Raymond, and the privately owned AirLink repeater. These repeaters provided the emergency communication links that facilitated the restoration of 911 communications back to the dispatch center for the duration of the power outages, Bishop explained. The Allens Park Neighbors Emergency Network and AirLink Alternative Access Radio Network participated. According to Bishop, as the Marshall Fire expanded, evacuation center support was requested at three locations to provide on-site situation reports using WinLink. Bishop said BCARES members and mutual aid ARIES operators from neighboring districts established local communication with the BCARES EOC radio position and designated field locations. BCARES was activated for two days. As Andrews reported, Boulder County announced on New Year's Day that nearly 1,000 homes were lost. In addition to his own home, the fire destroyed his daughter's home next door, as well as the homes of all his close neighbors. We had no official warning of the coming firestorm, Andrews said. My only warning was from our daughter, who saw it happening. No one died as a result of the fire, but Andrews added, KH6HTV video, as a supplier of ATV gear, will be out of operation for a very long time to come. Andrews edits the monthly Boulder Amateur Television Club TV Repeaters Repeater Newsletter. Thomas Dick, KF2GC, section manager for the AWRL Northern New York section, has stepped down after serving first from 2000 to 2006 and again from 2009 to present day. AWRL Field Services Manager Mike Walters, W8ZY, has appointed Rocco Conti, WU2M of Gloversville, New York, to succeed him on an interim basis. Conti has served as an assistant section manager and district emergency coordinator for the last several years. His appointment became effective on January 17, 2022.
A large ARRL team of member volunteers, program representatives, and presenters will advance the convention theme inviting attendees to rediscover radio at Orlando Hamcation, host of the 2022 ARRL National Convention, February 10th through the 13th. A wide-ranging roster of workshops, exhibits, and activities will educate and entertain radio amateurs committed to developing knowledge and skills in radio technology and radio communication. The convention will be held in two parts. On Thursday, February 10th, an all-day ARRL National Convention program will be held at the Doubletree by Hilton Hotel Orlando at SeaWorld. Advanced registration is required and includes a series of day-long ARRL training tracks and a National Convention luncheon. Registration can be completed online. DX Engineering is the official sponsor of the 2022 ARRL National Convention Program. On Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, February 11th through the 13th, Hamcation will take place at the Central Florida Fairgrounds and Expo Park in Orlando, an 87-acre lakefront fairgrounds. The convention marks the 75th anniversary of Hamcation, one of the largest annual gatherings of radio amateurs in the United States. Hamcation tickets can be purchased online until January 31st and at the gate during the event. The centerpiece of ARRL's participation will be a large exhibit area in the East and West Hall. Nearly a dozen ARRL program areas will be represented, including radio sport and DXCC card checking, radio clubs, the Amateur Radio Emergency Service, development, and the ARRL Foundation. A suite of exhibits organized by the ARRL Education and Learning Department will include an introduction to the new ARRL Learning Center. ARRL Education and Learning Manager Steve Goodgame, K5ATA, will introduce this new member benefit that includes online courses, videos, and other amateur radio instruction and training. At another booth, ARRL Education and Technology Program Instructor Tommy Gober, N5DUX, will cover the ARRL Teachers Institute on wireless technology. ARRL has invited several ham radio content creators from popular YouTube channels to meet and interact with attendees in the exhibit area. Josh Nass, KI6NAZ, of the popular Ham Radio Crash Course YouTube channel will moderate. He is the 2020 winner of the ARRL Bill Leonard Award for Outstanding Published Media that Advances Amateur Radio. Visitors will have a chance to meet ARRL authors and editors. ARRL laboratory engineers and volunteers will offer free testing of visitors' handheld radios. This service will determine the spectral purity of the output signal from their radios. Members and other attendees can meet ARRL elected officials and field organization volunteers at the Southeastern Division booth to catch up on events and to explore opportunities to get involved through their ARRL sections and radio clubs. The exhibit area will also include the ARRL store and membership area, where visitors may join, renew, or extend ARRL and Diamond Club memberships and purchase publications, apparel, and 2022 field day products. New ARRL membership manager, Matt Caruso, will be eager to meet and greet members. Now, with a more close-up look at the 2022 ARRL National Convention and the Orlando Hamcation, we go to our own Chris Perrine, KB2FAF. Thanks, Terry. ARRL is sponsoring three forums at the upcoming Orlando Hamcation. An ARRL emergency communications panel will be held at 3.15 p.m. Eastern on Friday, the panel will be moderated by ARRL Director of Emergency Management, Josh Johnston, KE5MHV, and will include panelists from the ARRL Southeastern Division Field Organization. On Saturday at 2 p.m. Eastern, ARRL Collegiate Amateur Radio Advisors Andy Maluzzi, KK4LWR, and Tony Maluzzi, KD8RTT, will lead a Collegiate Amateur Radio Forum. The ARRL Collegiate Amateur Radio Initiative is a regular networking resource among active campus radio clubs and their student members. An ARRL membership forum will be held on Saturday at 3.15 p.m., moderated by Southeastern Division Director Mickey Baker, N4MB. This forum offers an opportunity to hear from ARRL representatives on key areas of member interest and amateur radio advocacy and to learn how ARRL supports dozens of ways to get involved and active on the air. Panelists will include President Rick Roderick, K5UR, and ARRL CEO David Minster, NA2AA. Thursday's training tracks at the Doubletree Hotel are organized as all-day workshops led by experienced presenters. Four tracks being offered include Contest University, Emergency Communications Academy, 
Hands-On Handbook, and Technology Academy. Registration includes a seat at the National Convention Luncheon, which will feature a keynote address by David Minster, NA2AA. Contest University, or CTU, will make its debut in the ARRL Southeastern Division. CTU Chairman Tim Duffy, K3LR, has organized the workshop with Terry Grizzer, K8MNJ, assembling a team of experienced contesters as presenters and instructors. Presentations will include Fred Kleber, K9VV slash NP2X, on contesting and emergency preparedness from the Caribbean. Chris Blake, NX4N, and George Wagner, K5KG, on mobile QSO party contesting. Louis Romero, W4LT, on single sideband contest audio characteristics. And Claudio Varillo, I4VEQ, on World Radio Sport Team Championship 2022 and 23. Duffy will present the Antenna Notebook. Max Fountain, KJ4EUT, will offer a youth perspective, covering ways to use amateur radio contesting to attract more young people to amateur radio and retain them. Emergency Communications Academy has been organized by Aries Newsletter Editor Rick Palm, K1CE, and MCOM Instructor Gordon Gibby, KX4Z. A panel of nationally recognized experts and trainers will conduct this workshop, which will cover current events, MCOM techniques, hardware, and software. Presenters include C. Matthew Curtin, KD8TTE, Helen Strawn, WC4FSU, Leland Gallup, AA3YB, Arc Thames, W4CPD, Christine Duez, K4KJN, Earl McDowell, K4ZSW, and Jeff Caphart, W4UFL. ARRL staff, including Director of Emergency Management Josh Johnson, KE5MHV, and Field Services Manager Mike Walters, W8ZY, will be on hand. NAS will lead the hands-on handbook training track. Presenters will take a deeper dive into a handful of popular amateur radio activities. Jason Johnston, KC5HWB, of the YouTube channel Ham Radio 2.0, will present Getting Started in Parks on the Air. Additional presentations will feature Patrick Stoddard, WD9EWK, on amateur satellites, getting on the air, and operating from almost anywhere. Kyle Craig, AA0Z, with Intro to Remote Operating and Education and Technology Program Instructor, Tommy Gober, N5DUX, with Coding and Amateur Radio. ARRL Pacific Division Director, Kristen McIntyre, K6WX, will lead the Technology Academy. Amateur radio is based on technology. The more we know about how things work, the more effective we can be as a radio amateur, said McIntyre who will also share a presentation about SWR. ARRL Lab Manager Ed Hare, W1, RFI, will present compliance with the new RF exposure rules, covering the rules and recent changes by the FCC. Michelle Thompson, W5, NYV, will present digital communications technology, offering an understanding for how information travels over the air and how digital communications work. Joel Willett, KD6W, will present Digital Amateur Radio Television, a new paradigm. He will include a review of broadcast television technology being deployed into the U.S. market, including ATSC 3.0, also called Next Gen TV, and share opportunities that will influence the next generation of digital amateur television. Bob McGuire, N4HY, will present ARDC technical projects and GEO slash HEO spacecraft proposals, discussing major projects supported by amateur radio digital communications to advance significant technical innovation in amateur radio. ARRL Central Division Vice Director Carl Lutchelswab, K9LA, who sits on the ARRL Electromagnetic Compatibility Committee, will also present. The Orlando Amateur Radio Club sponsors Orlando Hamcation. Hundreds of volunteers, including radio amateurs from radio clubs throughout the region, help support the event. 
Further details about the convention are available at www.arrl.org slash expo and www.hamcation.com. Federal Communications Commission Chairwoman Jessica Rosenworcel named two prominent radio amateurs among her appointments to the FCC Technological Advisory Council on January 19th. Appointed were Greg Lappin, N9GL, and Michelle Thompson, W5NYV. Lappin chairs the ARRL RF Safety Committee and has represented ARRL, the National Association for Amateur Radio, on the Technological Advisory Council since 2001. ARRL Laboratory Manager Ed Hare, W1RFI, noted that Lappin has been involved with RF safety and the FCC since the last significant rule changes in 1998, he said. He is again helping the FCC prepare information on OET Bulletin 65 Supplement B for amateur radio, giving guidance for amateurs who need to comply with the FCC rules on RF exposure. His work is highly respected by the FCC and the ARRL lab, making it easier for amateurs to evaluate their stations. Thompson is Chief Executive Officer of the Open Research Institute, which she will represent on the TAC. ORI is a nonprofit research and development organization dedicated to open source work that includes such areas as amateur satellites and digital communications. She is an ARRL Life member. Thompson will discuss digital communications technology on February 10th at the ARRL National Convention in Orlando as part of the Technology Academy workshop track. The Technological Advisory Council serves to assist the Commission in identifying important areas of innovation and developing informed technology policies that support U.S. competitiveness in the global economy. The TAC will consider and advise the FCC on topics such as the upcoming 6G wireless, artificial intelligence, advanced spectrum sharing technologies, and emerging wireless technologies, including new tools to restore internet access during shutdowns and other disruptions. The Technological Advisory Council will hold its first meeting of the year on February 28th. Come in, come in. Don't worry about your muddy shoes. The shack is in the usual shambles anyway. I've been pretty busy these last few weeks because I'm involved in the celebrations of 100 years of British broadcasting and our BBC Radio Club was able to get the special call sign GB100 BBC. Several members have been cocking up large numbers of contacts all over the world. But have a listen to this one. Our club member Abdul, operating the call sign, is in contact with Jalia, 4 Sierra 7 Juliet Lima stroke Maritime Mobile, a Sri Lankan radio ham on board a large container ship right in the middle of the North Atlantic. Okay, call from 100 uh, BBC, 4 Sugar 7 uh, Japan Lima Maritime Mobile from North Atlantic. <laughs> Nice to work you, Abdul, with your uh, special call. Looks like uh, belongs to BBC and uh, looks like celebrating the 100 years of BBC. I'm not sure. I don't have internet, but uh, please give me the detail uh, next over. What? Yes, okay, Jal. Yeah, yeah, no problem at all. Yeah, this is celebrating 100 years of uh, the BBC. The call sign has been given to us for a year. When you do get the internet, there is a QRZ.com page. Brilliant stuff, eh? What a fantastic thing to write into the log. And if you're a licensed radio ham, I do hope you'll have a chance to work our special call sign. The Federal Communications Commission has posted an opening for an attorney advisor in the mobility division of its Wireless Telecommunications Bureau in Washington, D.C. As a principal attorney with mid to senior level responsibilities, the individual's job duties would include working on policy, rulemaking, and legal issues, drafting commission and bureau-level rulemaking and adjudication decisions, and reviewing proposed legislation, rulemakings, orders, and changes to regulations. According to the FCC website, the Mobility Division is responsible for developing policy and rules that facilitate rapid, widespread deployment of wireless communication services. Along with the Broadband Division, it oversees nearly 2 million licenses used to provide an array of wireless services. The Mobility Division helps carry out the Broadband Personal Communication Service to provide LAN Mobile, 
used for dispatch and remote monitoring of equipment to maritime and aviation to personal use, such as ham radio. AWRL Chief Executive Officer David Minster, NA2AA, has suggested that the position listing be shared by AWRL members who may know an attorney interested in communications law and who has an amateur license. The non-supervisory position is at the top of the government pay scale. Minster went on to say that he would urge any amateur who is an attorney and has several years of experience to apply, especially if they are interested in wireless. The deadline to apply for this opening is January 28, 2022. In 1982, after a long prohibition, amateur radio was partially permitted in China, but it wasn't until 1992 that permission was finally granted to establish personal amateur radio stations in the home. Since then, 170,000 people have become radio amateurs. The National Amateur Radio Society in China, the CRAC, says that 2022 marks the 40th anniversary of the partial restoration of amateur radio in China and the 30th anniversary of the full service becoming available again. In the 1980s, under the vigorous promotion of the older generation of former radio amateurs and with the support of relevant government departments, China's amateur radio activities started to sprout again in the country's new wind of reform. In 1982, club amateur radio stations were allowed to resume. With the attention of enthusiastic people from all walks of life in China and the help of overseas radio amateurs, amateur radio technology and people were reunited in China and a group of new radio amateurs were trained. Public knowledge of amateur radio improved, which corrected historical misunderstanding and suspicion, laying a solid foundation for a comprehensive recovery. In 1992, the amateur radio business was fully opened. In the following 10 years, the number of amateur radio stations and operators in the country increased sharply by more than two orders of magnitude, and the popularity expanded rapidly. In 2013, the relevant state departments established the management system of amateur radio stations, reducing the number of intermediary management links and artificial delays in applying for setting up amateur radio stations. The amateur radio branch of the China Radio Association is entrusted by the State Radio Administration to undertake a series of management and supporting services for the identification of amateur radio operating technical capabilities, as well as to ensure the smooth management process of station establishment. The CRAC soon joined the International Amateur Radio Union Council. CRAC is the representative of radio amateurs and organizations in China. In the past 40 years, China's radio amateur business has leapt from being behind in the world to now being one of the most advanced. At present, about 170,000 people have obtained radio licenses at all levels. There are a large number of outstanding talents, research spirit and hands-on skills that have been cultivated within the country, and they're playing their roles out in a variety of different scenarios. Radio amateurs became the earliest practitioners in China to realize direct dialogue between the ground and space, the first guarantors to establish an emergency communication network in the disaster area on the day of the Wenchuan earthquake, and the designers and manufacturers of the world's first amateur satellite orbiting the moon. The active role of radio amateurs in China is increasingly recognized and praised by all sectors of society. China's amateur radio over its past 100 years of history has been full of setbacks. Radio amateurs are still a group which is not strong. For example, putting up antennas may cause anxiety and controversy amongst neighbours. Some passers-by raise eyebrows and appear doubtful of the legality of such things. In the rather colourful language of this translation from the original Chinese, CRAC says that so long as radio amateurs pursue technological process and contribute to society as the cornerstone, adhering to the traditional ham radio spirit of consideration, loyalty, enterprise, fraternity, moderation and patriotism, and overcoming adversity, the hobby will surely grow into a lush forest out of the sea of flowers. Every Chinese radio amateur must keep in mind that amateur radio is not just a hobby, it's a high-level activity that must be carried out within the framework of radio regulations, being bound by the definition of the amateur service. 
A person's level of radio knowledge can be gradually improved, but at all times they must strictly abide by the laws and regulations of their license. And Chinese hams have a duty to participate in publicity that is conducive to the healthy development and recognition of amateur radio. Looking ahead, amateur radio in China has a bright future. A modern, big country needs to have a world-class radio amateur population and an amateur service level commensurate with its status. Coming up next, which TV should I buy? And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. This gives me an excuse to kind of explain all of this alphabet soup that's around modern TVs. I'll start off by saying... There really are two technologies you should be aware of for LCD or big screen flat panel displays. There's LCD, and that is even if it says QLED or LED, it's still an LCD. The way LCDs work, liquid crystal displays work, is kind of like a shutter. The liquid crystal is actually a shutter that opens and closes very rapidly. Behind it, there is a backlight, and the backlight is white. It is as pure a white light as they can get, uh, and there are a variety of ways of generating that. In the old days, it used to be fluorescent. Now, it's almost always LED, hence the LED in the name. But it's still a liquid crystal display with shuttering, and of course, it does red, green, and blue, and it changes those appropriately if you give you the right colors. So most of the time when you're talking about different technologies with LCD TVs, you're really talking about the backlight, and there are varieties of ways of doing this. Uh, Scott Wilkinson will talk about something called FALD, which is full array local dimming. That is basically, when we had uh, fluorescent tubes, you'd have a few fluorescent tubes. And you might have noticed some hot spots, some brighter spots. It wasn't even. With full array local dimming, you have a full array of LEDs. They're cheaper than fluorescents. They're also more reliable behind the liquid crystal shutters so that there is an even amount of light on almost every pixel. That's important. And local dimming is great because it means instead of just opening and closing the shutter to a certain degree to make it brighter or darker, you can even turn the backlight in, an, in a local area down or off, which gives you a broader dynamic range, darker blacks, brighter whites. That's always something that's been a problem on LCDs. LCDs are very bright. They're great for brightly lit rooms. They're also the least expensive technology out there. But they've always had an issue uh, compared to the older plasma technology and the newer OLED technology. They just didn't have the, the dynamic range, the, the high dynamic range of darkest darks and brightest brights because this backlight couldn't be dimmed. So FALD, full array local dimming, is the most recent technology to help you get a broader dynamic range of lighting on your TV, and that really helps. The most important thing, frankly, if you ask me, among all the specs, we talk about UHD or 4K. That's the number of dots on the screen. We also talk about HDR. That is the most important spec, high dynamic range because the broader the dynamic range the more like real world lighting it looks like even today tvs photography very few things can cover the full array of brightness and darkness that your eyes can but the closer they come the more natural the more realistic it'll look and nowadays since many movies are shot in hdr many sources are hdr it really does make a difference in the quality. I think more than the resolution, especially with a big screen like that, you're going to be sitting at a, dist a little bit of a distance, 10 feet probably, or, or more from the TV. The number of pixels per inch is less important than the HDR. So HDR is good, and I would recommend it. I should mention that if you're, and you're looking at these 4K TVs, you will not get the benefit of a 4K TV or HDR unless your input sources support 4K HDR as well. This is something that happens to people when they buy these new TVs, you know, 500 bucks, great deal. And then they realize, but I'm not getting 4K pictures because you're using an old cable box or an old Roku or an old Apple TV. You will be upgrading if you want to get that full benefit of those beautiful TVs. The sources, your cable box can go to 4K, call your cable company. There are 4K Rokus, the Roku Ultra, Apple TV comes in 4K as well. 
If you use an AV receiver, it will also have to be 4K. So if you're pumping your Apple TV into a receiver and then into your TV, you're going to have to upgrade the receiver as well. I ended up buying everything new in order to support my TV. Now, the best pictures in 4K are actually not LCD. I think they've made some great progress. QLED is is really good. Fall, full array local dimming, as I mentioned, is really good. But the best picture in uh, flat screen TVs these days is OLED. Uh, they don't make plasmas anymore. OLED's the best. It is more expensive. Problem is you can't tell at the Costco because they're set on the demo mode, which is a very bright, colors are extra vivid to make you go, ooh, that looks good. That's not what you want when you get it home. You're going to turn that off, put it in cinema mode. The colors will be more muted. The light will be not quite as bright. It'll be more natural. When your eyes get used to that, it's actually preferable. It's a much more accurate picture, but that's never what they show in the store. So it's very hard to, to judge side-by-side -side TVs. There's one more thing to consider in both of these, and that's the software. Smart TVs. That means you can run Netflix, YouTube. You might even be able to run a browser in them. I caution you against using that as a way to choose TVs. Because in most cases, smart TVs, the software is not as good as the same software running on a Roku or an Apple TV. They're not kept as up to date. It's not unusual, for instance, I have Samsung TVs that the browsers are no longer useful because they've expired and they haven't been keeping them up to date. You'll also find with Samsung anyway, uh, they put ads in the smart TV interface. I'm not a big fan of that. I don't want to see ads for Samsung products. In some cases, you can turn that off. But I would, if, if you think you're going to use the smart TV features, I would look at them and make sure, A, that the usability is good. I think Samsung and LG both are, are fairly good in that regard. But you might want to try it to make sure you agree. You like the remote. Uh, I think, again, that's more a matter of personal taste than actual technical differences. I think they're both pretty good. And I would take a look at the, interf the, the interface for the smart TV if they're showing you ads. You should also read, I know this is a lot of work, but you might want to also read the privacy statement. One of the reasons I'm not a fan of smart TVs in general is they very often, in fact, I would say almost universally, certainly with Samsung, and I bet with LG too, uh, watch what you're watching and send that information back to marketers for advertising and ratings purposes. You may not want that. What I generally do with smart TVs, I don't connect them to the internet. Uh, well, I don't want the smart features and I really don't want the privacy invasion. When you don't connect a TV like that to the internet, it can't do that. It can't watch what you're watching. It can't put ads on the screen, it, but you won't be able to use the smart TV features. So that's another reason to recommend getting a good Roku Ultra or an Apple TV 4K, plugging that into the TV and using that uh, instead of using the uh, Samsung or LG smart TV features. It is a good idea to check to see if you're getting the latest model. It's going to be a little tricky because when they sell in big box stores, a lot of companies and both Samsung and LG are doing this use model numbers that don't match what they use when they sell in other places. So you can't compare models. Often the models sewn in the big box, sold in the big box stores are older. They're last year's TV. And normally with both LG and Samsung, that model number would tell you what year it is, but they've changed these so that you can't, you can't tell. You might do a Google search on UN7300 or TU700D to see what model year that is. Not the worst thing in the world. That's one of the reasons they're very affordable. If it's last year's model, there haven't been big leaps forward in technology. It's just something to be aware of. 65 inches is a good size. Uh, it really does depend on how close you are to the TV. 65 inches is okay for 10 feet. But if you're going to be 15 feet or more behind, you're going to want to get a bigger TV because ideally, this TV is almost a cinema-like experience. Ideally, you want it to you know, cover 45, 50 degrees uh, of view. It's not going to be 90 degrees, but you don't want to be looking left and right. It's not like you're sitting in the front row at the movie theater. But you want enough so that you know, your peripheral vision is actually seeing something. So that's about 50 degrees, something like that. Maybe, I don't know, maybe that's 90 degrees. So you, you want to be fairly close to it. There are online guides to viewing angle and distance and the appropriate size. 65 is pretty big, but there's some things to think about uh, in terms of the technologies. Anyway, I'm glad you were here and I'm here and I'll be here next week. And I hope you'll come by and bring your friends too as we talk high tech.
Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Are you ready for another trip into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives here on This Week in Amateur Radio. And now with this week's edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here's Bill Continelli, W2XOY. Cairo, Egypt, 1938. In the pre-war time of colonial empires, this conjures up an image of Europeans in white linen suits sitting on the veranda of a luxuriously decadent colonial hotel. Oppressive ceiling fans, dark, mysterious strangers, Peter Lorre, and Sidney Greenstreet. However, for amateurs, Cairo in 1938 meant a setback. The first international radio telegraph conference was held in Washington, D.C. in 1927. Although amateurs lost almost 40% of their allocations, the concept of amateur radio as a legal international hobby was established. The second conference was held in Madrid in 1932, and that produced no changes in ham radio. Now the third conference was at hand, but times had changed. Italy, Germany, and Spain were under fascist dictatorships. Stalin was directing a ruthless purge in the Soviet Union, and Japan was at war with China. The shortwaves were filled with propaganda broadcasts and military communications. Under this cloud of uncertainty, delegates from 71 countries assembled in Cairo on February 1, 1938. How would amateur radio be treated under these circumstances? Actually, American hams came out of the battle with no major losses. Despite the number of dictatorships at the conference, there was no attempt to destroy amateur radio, which, after all, allowed individual citizens access to receivers and transmitters. The most serious threat came from Japan, which proposed that amateurs be limited to 50 watts input. The Japanese plan was easily defeated. The ARRL had pushed for expanded HF bands, but the American delegation, mindful of the potential hostility at the conference, did not propose it. The headlines in the July 1938 QST summed up Cairo. American amateurs retain all frequencies after a terrific fight. USA puts up splendid defense. European hams shortchanged by greedy governments. And European broadcasting to invade 7 megacycle band in late 1939. In Europe, the 7200 to 7300 kilocycle segment of the 40 meter band would be shared with broadcasters starting September 1st, 1939. They also lost half of the 80 meter band to broadcasting and other services, and the European 5 meter band was scaled back to make way for television. However, it could have been a lot worse. The next international conference was set for Rome in 1942. It never took place. In other 1938 news, the amateur population was stabilized at 50,000 after years of growth. This was partly due to the increase in the code speed from 10 to 13 words per minute in 1937, with regenerative receivers and crystal control transmitters, which meant that two stations having a QSO would probably be on two separate frequencies. Many hams felt that 50,000 was the saturation point for our bands. On October 4, 1938, the FCC issued complete new amateur regulations. Included in the package were two new ham bands at 112 and 224 megacycles. What could hams do up there? Try amateur television. An all-electronic form of television was replacing the mechanical spinning disc, and QST carried several articles discussing the theory and construction of amateur TV stations. W6XAO was an experimental TV station in L.A., which would soon be followed by other pioneers, such as W2XBS. Where have I heard that call before? On September 2, 1938, the new Maxim Memorial Station, W1AW, was dedicated at 225 Main Street in Newington, Connecticut. The station was in memory of Hiram Percy Maxim, the founder and first president of the ARRL, 
who died in February 1936. Less than one month after Maxim's death, floods roared through the Connecticut River Valley and destroyed W1MK, which had been the league station. Later, in 1936, the ARRL Board of Directors allocated $18,000 to build a memorial station to honor W1AW, as well as to replace W1MK. The station would stand alone on Main Street in Newington until joined in 1963 by the ARRL QST offices, which moved from West Hartford. On September 13, 1938, Ross Howell, editor of QST, died after being electrocuted in his home. He had been working on a homebrew TV receiver. Ross was a native of Australia and held the call 3JU while living down under. He did not hold a U.S. license because the citizenship application was not finalized. Despite his lack of American amateur privileges, Ross Hull was instrumental in early VHF-UHF developments. He designed practical and inexpensive 5-meter stations and greatly contributed to the knowledge of VHF-UHF propagation. His death dramatically pointed out the dangers of working on live circuits, and for months thereafter, QST ran articles on how to switch to safety. No discussion of 1938 would be complete without including the Great Hurricane. In the fourth week of September, New England and Long Island, already soaked by previous rainstorms, were pounded by the unnamed hurricane, which was completely unexpected. Over 600 people died, and damage was $500 million in 1938 dollars. The new W1AW Memorial Station, just three weeks old, survived without any damage, although power was lost for 36 hours. Hundreds of amateurs grabbed whatever generators and batteries they could find and set up emergency stations on 5 meter AM and 160, 80, and 40 CW. Amateurs were the only source of communication for dozens of communities and handled everything from health and welfare traffic to police communications. It was a superb demonstration of public service at its best. In our next installment, we will look at amateur radio in World War II. Yes, amateurs were off the air, but what did they do if they weren't in uniform? What filled the pages of QST? And what was this words? Join me as the Ancient Amateur Archives Seeks the Truth. In the February 2022 issue of QST magazine, ARRL President David Minster, November Alpha 2 Alpha Alpha, has written an editorial on the subject of diversity and inclusion in driving amateur radio's growth. He concentrates on youth, pointing out the importance of using correct pronouns and adding that asking for more youth in amateur radio represents a cultural challenge. The young people of today are not the young people of our youth. He commented that who they are as people is different. What they are looking for from our hobby is different. The time pressure on being digitally connected and always being on is different. The real-time nature of how young people consume content is different. Even their shifting opinions and preferences relating to social media are different from just one year ago. Amateur radio must recognise and embrace these differences and dynamically adapt to accommodate them. The ARRL president said that he respects the wide points of view on the matter of diversity. He said he was very aware of how these changes will be met with discomfort in the coming years. He hoped that ARRL members would hang in there whenever and wherever diversity issues appeared within the hobby of amateur radio. You can read the QST editorial on the ARRL website. And Michelle Thompson, Whiskey 5 November Yankee Victor, is expected to touch on diversity issues when she presents a talk to the Radio Amateur Training, Planning and Activities Committee entitled Past, Present and Future – What Do US Hams Look Like Today? The talk will be on Zoom at 14 hours UTC on Wednesday, January the 26th. If you want to join in, follow the link given at sites.google.com forward slash view forward slash rat pack. That's Romeo Alpha Tango Papa Alpha Charlie. And the video should also be available on the Rat Pack YouTube channel. Time now for the AMSAT report. A tiny amateur satellite has been launched by SpaceX on January 13th. It is Delphi PQ. 
It uses GMSK up to 19K2 on 436-650 MHz. What makes this amateur satellite unique is its measurements of only 5 by 5 by 18 centimeters. That makes it one of the smallest satellites in the world. It was built by Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands. Building small allows Delft University teams to build a new satellite with the latest technologies every one or two years. They also built this one to determine if it could be distinguished from all the space debris as an orbiting satellite. SpaceX also launched a Brazilian amateur satellite Pion BR-1. It has a digital store and forward message system using the NG-HAM protocol. The downlink is on 437.300. The new satellite launches are really kicking off the air with a brand new fleet. It will be interesting to see the other projects that are launching this year. The AMSAT report comes to us each week courtesy of Bruce Page, KK5DO. The National Society for German Radio Amateurs, DARC, was hit by a cyber attack on January 15th. As of January 20th, their website was still down. According to the DARC on January 15th, the homepage of the DARC became the target of a cyber attack. The attack exploited a security vulnerability in a plugin in a WordPress installation. On January 17, 2022, the attack spread to the main pages of our association. The attack was detected on January 17, and then promptly stopped and repelled. At 2200 on the same day, the home page from Friday's backup could be put back online. Our provider analyzed the traffic for the affected period and said that he could not detect any abnormalities, so a data leak cannot be assumed. We therefore assume that the presumably automated attack was only aimed at redirecting to Russian websites and not spying on member data. The member data is stored in folders separate from the website. Complete bank details or other sensitive information are not included in this data, as the bank details stored for the purposes of assignment are only stored in abbreviated form. The login passwords of the members are stored encrypted. Despite the unlikely risk of data leakage, the Board of Directors would like to inform you of the process and will take further action to be on the safe side. In order to clarify the facts, the Executive Board has filed a criminal complaint against unknown persons. Likewise, the Hessian Data Processing Officer was informed today as a precaution about the hacker attack. Furthermore, an IT company is commissioned with the forensic processing of the facts. We also took immediate action to secure our systems. We will continue to implement measures in the coming days to further increase the security of our systems. The executive board takes this attack very seriously and has stipulated that our system may not go fully online again until safe operation is guaranteed. In addition to various other topics, it is also about the security of passwords for the internal area of the members. To this end, the first measures have already been discussed, which will be communicated and implemented in the coming days. We therefore ask our members for your understanding if the homepage with all its peripherals will not be available as usual in the next few days. The next few days and weeks will also bring various changes to ensure the security of the member data entrusted to us in the future. In order to maintain communication during this time, we will use Facebook in addition to Twitter to inform you. Tad Cook, K7RA in Seattle, reports solar and geomagnetic activity increased this week. The average daily sunspot number was up by 52 points, rising from 42.4 to 94.4. The sunspot number peaked at 120 on Saturday, January 15th. Average daily solar flux went from 101.6 to 112, peaking at 119.4 on January 16th. Tamitha Scove, WX6SWW, reports our sun is getting busy. 
Well, you know, we've got triple digits back when it comes to that solar flux, and it looks like it's going to continue to stay that way easily over this week and next week with, with the new regions that are rotating into Earth view. So radio propagation on Earth's day side should continue to stay in the good range. And as long as you can get through the, the issues with that solar storm that has been, you know, causing some havoc on the night side, well, just hang in there. Things will get better. Relief and communication efforts were coming slowly to the island nation of Tonga, which was left cut off from the rest of the world after two consecutive natural disasters. The eruption of an underwater volcano triggered a deadly tsunami that devastated the nation of Tonga, throwing the Pacific island chain into a communication blackout. While military relief efforts struggled to bring clean water and basic supplies from Australia and New Zealand to the residents, Tonga's apparent lack of active amateur radio operators spelled silence on those frequencies. Amateurs in New Zealand, who are also active first responders, awaited word on what help was needed by radio or other means. Don Wallace, ZL2TLL, a director of IARU Region 3, said in an email he and Andrew Bate, ZL1SU, manager of the New England Red Cross IT and Telecom Emergency Response Unit, were among those waiting word on whether they would be deployed. Don said the Red Cross itself was already providing aid. In a public posting on Facebook, Mark Hanrahan, VK4DMH, president of the Gold Coast Amateur Radio Society, VK4WIG, said the only communication available from Tonga appeared to be via a few satellite phones, which were proving unreliable. Imagine logging a DX contact from any of the seven islands and atolls in the Central Pacific Ocean, managed by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. According to OPDX, this group is known as the Pacific Remote Islands Marine National Monument. The expeditions don't often happen there. In fact, it's been almost four years since a five-member team from the Northern California DX Foundation landed on Baker Island using the call sign KH1 forward slash KH7Z. The Foundation's Don Greenbaum, N1DG, is now leading an effort to open the islands up for more DXers to have the kind of experience he and his teammates had on Baker Island in 2018. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, along with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, have received public comment on the proposal, which has the support of the Foundation. As a new management plan is being drafted for the islands, DXers want to be confident it will ensure continued occasional access there. The comment window closed on January 20th, but the foundation is hopeful. It said in a statement, ham radio was used by the early colonizers of Howland, Baker, and Jarvis Islands in the mid-1930s. It is a tradition that extends to today with the 2018 Baker Island Radio Expedition. Call signs have just been issued for two special event stations to commemorate 1,900 years since Hadrian's Wall was built in the UK. It was the northern frontier of the mighty Roman Empire and also the inspiration for The Wall in George R. R. Martin's Game of Thrones. There will be two special event stations, GB1900 Hotel Alpha and GB1900 Hotel Whiskey, running throughout 2022. Austin Vaughan, Mike Zero, Mike November Echo in South Shields on Tyneside, and Roger Nicholson, Mike Zero, Tango Kilo, Foxtrot in Hexham, Northumberland, will be operating the stations from near the wall and will be active throughout the year on the HF and VHF bands in voice, CW and digital modes. The special event stations will officially be part of the Hadrian's Wall 1900 Festival, where hundreds of events and activities will be taking place in a year-long festival across Hadrian's Wall. Take a look at the hashtags HW1900 and Hadrian's Wall. QSL will be via Logbook of the World and Clublog OQRS. See QRZ.com for more information on GB1900HA and GB1900HW. A website gives much more detail of the planned events. Just go to 1900.hadrianswallcountry.co.uk and follow the link to events. You can also email the team using hw1900radio at gmail.com. Foundations of Amateur Radio A little while ago, I mentioned in passing that I was considering implementing a parrot repeater to help determine how your radio is performing. Discussion afterwards revealed that not everyone had the same picture in mind, 
So I thought I'd share with you some of what I'm considering and why. Most of the modern radio landscape revolves around hooking a computer up to some type of radio frequency capable device. Commonly, it's the audio and control signals that travel between computer and radio, but there are plenty of examples where raw data makes the journey, like in the case of an RTL SDR dongle. That journey is increasingly made using USB, the cable, not the sideband, and limits are based around the maximum speed that a universal serial bus has. Essentially, the amount of data that you can process is limited by how fast your computer can talk to the radio. For my parrot repeater, I'm imagining a device that can receive RF from any radio and process that signal to determine what the center frequency is, the deviation, the stability, the mode, whatever parameters I end up being able to determine. A whole other discussion on its own. In response, the idea is that the device generates a report and either presents that using text-to-speech or as a web page, or both. Using traditional methods, this would involve a radio, a computer, some software, connections between the radio and the computer, not to mention power for both the computer and the radio, an antenna and perhaps an amplifier. The picture I have in mind is not anything like that. I'm imagining a single device that takes power and does all I've described inside the one device. No external computer, no audio cables, no control cables, no hard drives, not anything. Just a Pluto SDR and a power source connected to an antenna or two. You might think that's fanciful. As it happens, we already have some of that today. When I run Dump 1090 on my Pluto SDR, it presents itself to the world as a website that I can visit to see which aeroplanes are within range, where they are exactly on a map, what messages they're sending, and where they're going. All of the processing is done inside the Pluto SDR. All I have to do is give it power and an internet connection. This is possible because the Pluto SDR is essentially a computer with RF. It runs Linux, and you can write software for it. Unlike my Yaesu FT857D, which also has a computer on board, rudimentary to be sure, but a computer nonetheless, it cannot be altered. I cannot load my own piece of software, launch a web browser and point it at my Yaesu, not without connecting an external computer that in turn needs to be connected to the radio. I might add that this is how many repeaters work and how devices that implement AllStar and Echolink manage to make the jump between the internet and the world of RF. If your eyes are not lighting up right now, let me see if I can put it in different terms. The Pluto SDR has the ability to access signals between 70 MHz and 6 GHz. It can do so in chunks of 56 MHz. Said differently, if you were able to consider all of the amateur HF spectrum from 0 to 54 MHz, you could fit all of it inside one chunk of 56 MHz that the Pluto SDR is capable of. You couldn't send it anywhere since you're limited to how fast the USB cable is, but you could technically process that inside the Pluto SDR itself. To get the Pluto SDR to see the amateur HF bands, you could connect it to a transverter in much the same way that today many 2 meter handheld radio owners use a transverter to get to 23 centimeters. Except in this case, we're going the other way. In order to actually use this massive amount of information, you're going to need to do some serious signal processing. Accessing 56 MHz of raw data is hard work, even if you don't have to get it across a serial connection. As it happens, the Pluto SDR also comes with an FPGA. As I've mentioned previously, it's like having a programmable circuit board, which can be programmed to do that signal processing for you. It has the capability to massage that massive chunk of data into something more reasonable. For example, you might be able to use it to extract each of the amateur bands individually and represent them as an image that you might show to the world as a waterfall on a web browser. Now, to be clear, I'm not saying that any of this exists just yet or fits within the existing hardware constraints. I'm only starting on this journey. I'll be learning much along the way. No doubt I'll be using existing examples, tweaking them to the point that I understand what they do and how they work. I've already been talking about some of this for years. As you might have discovered, this adventure is long with many different side quests, and at the rate I'm going, I'm confident that this represents the breadth and depth of what amateur radio means to me. So if you're wondering why I'm excited, it's because the amateur radio world of opportunity is getting bigger, not smaller. 
Amono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. Citing age, health, and personal issues, Peter Yost, HB9, CET, has stepped down as International Amateur Radio Union Region 1 Monitoring System Vice Coordinator. He will continue to serve as coordinator for Switzerland's IARU member society, USKA. IARU Region 1 said that Yost, who received the International Amateur Radio Union Region 1 Monitoring System Medal in 2021, has made a major contribution to the International Amateur Radio Union Region 1 Monitoring System, newsletters, and developed excellent professional presentation material on union work. He was acting International Amateur Radio Union Region 1 Monitoring System Coordinator for a period until October 2020 and served as Deputy Coordinator for many years. We warmly thank Peter Yost, HB9 CET, for his long commitment to the International Amateur Radio Union Region 1 Monitoring System and his excellent work and contributions, a spokesman for the IARU said. Nathan Frizzell, W2NAF, an assistant professor at the University of Scranton Department of Physics and Electrical Engineering, has received a National Science Foundation grant of nearly $50,000 to support the 2022 Ham Radio Science Citizen Investigation, or HAMSci, workshop. With more details on the upcoming workshop, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, reporting from Ellsworth, Maine. The event is set for March 18th and 19th at the U.S. Space and Rocket Center in Huntsville, Alabama. The in-person conference also has a virtual format option. HAMSI is a collective of professional researchers and radio amateurs with the objective of fostering collaboration between the amateur and professional communities. The workshop will serve as a team meeting for the HAMSI personal space weather station project that project seeks to harness the power of a network of radio amateurs to better understand and measure the effects of weather in the upper levels of earth's atmosphere the theme for the two-day hamsi workshop is the weather connection presentation abstracts for the workshop are welcome visit hamsi.org forward slash hamsi 2022 I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. The workshop series has led to cutting-edge work in the fields of space physics, citizen science, and the use of crowdsourced ionospheric data, Frizzell said. To maximize the potential of the ham radio and professional researcher relationship, meetings are needed to bring these groups together to learn about each other's communities and vocabularies, to share ideas, and to participate in activities that advance both the scientific field and the radio hobby. Frizzell's research focuses on the ionosphere, the atmospheric region that extends 50 to 600 miles above the Earth's surface. According to Frizzell, changes in the ionosphere alter the behavior of radio wave propagation and greatly affect the radio communications and global navigational satellite systems. Understanding ionospheric structures and processes will lead to an increased understanding and prediction of these effects, he said. Frizzell said he's still seeking presentation abstracts for the workshop. You can participate by submitting abstracts using the form on the HAMSI workshop webpage. Operators Martina, Delta Foxtrot 3, Tango Sierra, and Thomas, Delta Charlie 8, Tango Mike, will activate Svalbard using Juliet Whiskey Stroke Home Calls to start their North Pole de-expedition between April the 9th and the 12th. Activity will be voice using single sideband and the digital mode FT8. They will then be active from the Russian Sevenyi Polyus, a scientific polar drifting base, approximately 800 kilometers from the North Pole on the Arctic Ocean, where they will activate the worldwide flora fauna area designated Romeo Foxtrot Foxtrot 0176. The operators will then use special call signs Delta Papa Zero Lima Echo and Romeo Alpha Delta Charlie 8 Tango Mike Portable and Romeo Alpha Stroke Delta Foxtrot 3 Tango Sierra Portable to represent the Russian flag of the camp between April the 14th and the 17th. Activity will be on 40, 30, 20 and 17 meters using single sideband and FT8.
Activity from the actual North Pole, that's 90 degrees north, will take place sometime during this period. The exact schedule will depend very much on weather conditions. Activity will be on 20 meters, approximately on 14244 kilohertz, and is limited to approximately 30 minutes only. For more details and updates, keep an eye on the Delta Charlie 8 Tango Mike entry on QRZ.com. Martina and Thomas say that the success of the expedition depends very much on the weather conditions, and the time schedule could change at any moment. Unfortunately, the expedition did not take place in 2020 or 2021 due to the coronavirus crisis, so this is the third attempt at the de-expedition. Two spacecraft comprised of wood or using wood framing are hoping to launch this year and next. One will carry an amateur radio payload. With more details on these unique wooden amateur satellites, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, who files this report, courtesy of the ARRL Audio News. The Wiser Woodsat, a Finnish spacecraft that planned to include an amateur radio payload, was forced to postpone its announced launch from 2021 to 2022 after the International Amateur Radio Union Amateur Satellite Frequency Coordination System turned away its request to use amateur radio frequencies. It said that the satellite's primary mission doesn't seem to be an amateur mission. Meanwhile, Lignosat, a 1U-sized CubeSat with an outside structure mainly composed of wood, has applied for IARU frequency coordination and hopes to launch from the ISS in 2023. Built by students at Japan's Kyoto University, Lignosat includes a unique amateur radio payload, but no transponder. The Lignosat application for IARU satellite frequency coordination in December said the CubeSat would carry amateur radio equipment that will extract call signs of amateur radio stations from uplinked FM packages signals and respond to them via the CW downlink and the sender's call signs to convey thank you messages. The plan proposes UHF downlinks for CW and FM. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. As announced last year, WISA Woodsat was designed to accommodate multiple missions from materials science, space education, and awareness to promoting and facilitating amateur radio communication with and via satellites. No transponder was on board, but the satellite's sponsors said they had the support of Finland's IARU member society, SRAL, to use amateur radio frequencies. They are now reworking the spacecraft to use commercial radio frequencies. To our great disappointment, we can't serve the radio amateur community with the LoRa repeater mission as we had hoped and planned. We will continue to share the pictures and data online, but the technical aspect has been diminished due to this decision, said Wysa Woodsat's chief engineer, Samuli Nyman of Arctic Astronautics. Meanwhile, the satellite's development team, comprised of Kyoto University and Sumimoto Forestry Company, said it's aiming to harness the environmental friendliness and the economy of wood in spacecraft development. They say a satellite with a wooden exterior would burn up upon re-entering Earth's atmosphere at the end of its mission, lessening its burden on the environment. The wooden framework also will permit the satellite's antennas to be inside the spacecraft. A plan is underway to use an experimental apparatus on the International Space Station to hold wooden sheets of varying hardness, taken from several tree species attached. These would remain exposed to the space environment for about nine months to determine their deterioration. The team is headed by Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency astronaut Tako Doi, now a Kyoto University professor, Doi was the first JAXA astronaut to take part in spacewalks from the shuttle Columbia in 1997. He said the concept, if successful, would lead the way to allowing even children who are interested in space to make a satellite. Lignosat would be deployed from the ISS in July 2023. The ICQ Amateur Radio podcast team 
has shifted ownership and management of the Homebrew Heroes Award to the Ham Radio Workbench podcast. It makes better branding sense for their team to acquire and manage this awards program, said Frank Howell, K4FMH, of the ICQ Amateur Hit Radio podcast team. Their episode-to-episode content clearly reflects the underlying principles of the Homebrew Heroes Award, as Hal detailed in the change in the January 2nd ICQ podcast. George Zafiropoulos, KJ6VU, of the Ham Radio Workbench Project, said we plan to maintain the award into the future. Speaking on behalf of the Ham Radio Workbench Podcast, Rod Hardman, VA3 Oscar November, said he was delighted to have the leadership role in the award program. It's a perfect fit for what we are about, he said. The Homebrew Hero Award was the brainchild of Hal during the 2019 Dayton Hamvention, which was the first time the ICQ Amateur Radio Podcast team had gathered in person. A few months later, the first award went to Hans Summers, G0UPL, of QRP Labs. Hal said he'll maintain a connection to the award program as a sponsor. The Northern Arizona DX Association will hold its third Distance Challenge special event at QuartzFest from January 23rd through the 29th. The idea behind the event is to see which QuartzFest attendee can make the longest distance portable contact from the Sonoran Desert using whatever radio and antenna they can bring in and set up. If they don't bring in a radio and antenna, they can still enter by using the special event W7Q communication trailer at QuartzFest. The trailer, owned by the Northern Arizona DX Association, will have three operating positions that can be used simultaneously, one for SSB, one for FD8, and one for CW. There will be four entry classes. Details are on the Northern Arizona DX Association website. Winners will each receive the unique trophy hard hat sponsored by Cable Experts. According to the OHIP Pen DX Association, Jean Michael F6AJA has thousands and thousands of QSL cards, some from rare DX entities, and he didn't even have to turn his rig on once to get them. Jean Michael has created an online gallery of images of nearly 20,000 QSL cards sorted into different albums including an assortment of the 10 most wanted DXCC entities spanning the years 2011 to 2020. The collection contains more than 500 cards from contacts on rare French Pacific Islands, more than 1,000 from the various research bases in Antarctica, and commemorative stations for the IARU and ITU. That collection has more than 900 cards. Hams collecting DX from the United States have contributed images from each of the states, all dating before 1945. The site is in French, but is available as an English translation. And now, with his segment on tower climbing and antenna safety, here is Arizona's own Greg Stoddard, KF9MP. Climbing with others. There are times when tower jobs we need to do require helpers assisting us on the ground and with us on the tower. These are special situations which require higher than normal levels of communication between team members. When hauling coax, antennas, sidearms, or other hardware up the tower, never hoist hardware up the tower with someone underneath the cargo, unless they're wearing the proper safety gear and have been trained in tower work. Let's face it, on a tower, you don't get a second chance. There are at least three sides to each tower. So keep the lower climber on a different side, and besides, a freestanding tower is happier when you spread the load more evenly. So before you start to do tower work with other climbers and ground crew, stop, take a moment, and discuss with everyone exactly what you intend to do, the goals to accomplish, the order the tasks will be done in, special hardware you may need, and a discussion about hoisting things up and down the tower. The guy on the ground should always have the job of keeping sidewalk supervisors away from the base area of the tower. Even a quarter twenty zinc plated nut falling 80 feet onto the top of an unprotected skull can leave a permanent dent, not to mention a thud that will be ringing for hours in the victim's head. There's a good argument here for wearing a hard hat. Few hams I know of own one or even know where to buy one, so the next best thing is only one person climbing at a time. If climbing with a person already strapped on working above you, choose a different side to climb on. If you're already on the tower, but the antenna you need to work on is like six feet out on a sidearm, a different set of rules apply. It is most likely that the sidearm is fully capable of holding your weight as is. My personal rule is to never totally trust any part of the tower, 
This includes sidearms. So I bring along my trusty 15 foot strap. This yellow strap is very lightweight but fully capable of pulling a snowbound car out of a ditch. I attach one end of this strap to my harness and the other to a tower leg about five feet or more above the point where the sidearm mounts. This strap is strong enough to catch the full weight of the sidearm, myself, and my cargo. If you're expecting to work on a sidearm, I strongly recommend you invest in one of these rescue type straps. Copy down my URL at the end of this segment if you don't know where to start looking for this type of information. Not only did I want this series to offer safety tips, I also wanted to offer hints to make the job go faster and easier. The way I figure, an easier climb is bound to be a safer climb. So let's cover a couple of quick hints. For your tower work, attach them to a short piece of fishing line. Use the woven multi-filament type. Make it long enough to tie a wrist strap in the other end. And tie the other end to the tool you don't wish to drop. If you have a friend with a leather working hobby, a good Christmas present would be a whole bunch of these straps. You can keep your tools securely on your arm and in your hand with one of these straps. Remember to order them large enough to fit around your arm when you're wearing cold weather climbing gear. Another one of my favorites is my coaxial cable hanger. I bent the hook in a piece of reinforcing steel bar, the type used in concrete work and often sold at hardware stores. I bent a squared hook in one end, about three inches over and five inches back down, sort of like a giant fishing hook. I use electrical tape to hold the coax onto the rod that I'm bringing up the tower as I climb. I secure about two feet of the coax to the rod. As I climb, I reach down, grab the hook and lift it to a tower rung up as high as I can reach. Don't forget a short piece of rope to secure the coax hook to a loop on your climbing belt just in case you might drop it. Some people like to lift coax after they get to the antenna that it connects to. I've had problems with coax damage doing it this way, so this has worked fine for me. I stretch out the coax on the ground and the crew helps feed it up to me as I climb further. This would probably not work on very long lengths and may be unnecessary on shorter towers. Remember, any time you spend learning about tower safety is an investment in yourself. Education is a big part of tower safety. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. Safety, Shahid, SD1A, KF6, WJZ, G1N, WJ of Albuquerque, New Mexico, died on January 10th. He was 73. Shahid was the founder and president of the Bangladesh Amateur Radio League, which was established after more than 12 years of hard lobbying and negotiating with government officials by Shahid and others. Until then, amateur radio operation from Bangladesh had been sporadic and of questionable legality. The Bangladesh Amateur Radio League became an International Amateur Radio Union member society in 1988. Shahid, whose background was in mechanical engineering and information technology, was the first Bangladeshi national to be licensed. He had been living in the U.S. since 1999 with his family, which includes his wife, Mamtaz, ST1J, KF6WJY, the first woman to be licensed in Bangladesh, and daughter, Maria Ashna, S21JA. Electron Benders Amateur Radio Club in Tulsa, Oklahoma, airs this week in amateur radio, every week on Club Own KOKTLP. 90.9. The Guardian newspaper reports that Elon Musk's satellite internet company Starlink has ambitious plans to bring internet access to people anywhere in the world. But it turns out that the venture is providing another service, warming up cats. Starlink gives users access to more than a thousand satellites, but a customer recently tweeted a photo of five cats huddled on their Starlink dish and noted that the presence of the furtive felines had slowed down internet performance. The customer commented that Starlink had worked just fine until the cats found out that the dish gives off a little heat on cold days. It seems that the cats have taken to the dish by choice rather than necessity. The cats have a heated cat house with water and food, but when it's minus 25 Celsius outside, they decide instead to sit on the Starlink dish. When the sun goes down, they head back to their house. The attraction may be due to a self-heating feature on the dish, which is designed to melt snow. In 2020, Starlink engineers touted efforts to upgrade this snow-melting ability. The customer said that the cat's attraction to the Starlink dish interrupted movie streaming and affected internet speed. They said it didn't remove the signal completely, but definitely slowed everything down.
and the customer is now planning to move the dish from the ground to a higher location. Starlink, a division of Elon Musk's SpaceX company, has launched more than 1,600 satellites. The company, which has permission from the US authorities to launch up to 12,000 satellites, says the service is ideally suited for areas where connectivity has been unreliable or completely unavailable. And finally this week, according to TechExplorers.com, researchers in chemistry at the University of Montreal have created what they call the world's tiniest antenna, one they have engineered using DNA to let them study structural changes that occur within proteins. This nano antenna uses light instead of the radio frequencies we hams are so accustomed to. Researcher Scott Heron said in a report, the DNA-based nano antennas can be synthesized with different lengths and flexibilities to optimize their function. He added later, by carefully tuning the nano antenna design, we have created a five nanometer long antenna that produces a distinct signal when the protein is performing its biological function. The researchers reported their findings recently in the journal Nature Methods. They compared the fluorescent nano antenna's performance to that of a repeater. It receives light in one wavelength and transmits back at another, depending on what behavior it detects in the protein. Many of the news and information items heard on this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the ARRL Audio News Service, and the ARRL Letter, the Southgate Amateur News Service, Steve Richards, G4 Hotel Papa Echo, and the Southgate Vibes News Service. AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, the FCC, the Radio Society of Great Britain, and Ofcom, the South African Radio League, the International Amateur Radio Union, the Wireless Institute of Australia, and the Australian Communications and Media Authority, the New Zealand Association of Radio Transmitters, the Amateur Radio Newsline, the Rain Hamcast, Eric Guth, 4Z1UG and QSO Today, QRZ.com, The Tech Guy, Leo Laporte, the International Telecommunications Union, and various news sources on the internet. With special thanks to all our weekly news sources and to you, our listeners, that wraps up this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio. If you'd like to write to us, you can find everything you need, including archive editions of the news service at our website, at TWIAR.net. And now, for all of us at This Week in Amateur Radio headquarters and our news team around the world, this is Chris Perrine, KB.